Hey, this is Pastor Allen. I'm the lead pastor here at First Baptist Church of Naples, and we are so happy that you have chosen to join us as we go through God's Word together. God's doing some amazing things here, and we pray that God's Word will transform you from the inside out. Our mission here is to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ of all peoples. And our hope is, is that you are being a disciple that makes disciples. Now, if you don't have a church home, we would love for you to join us either in person or continuing online as we go into God's Word together every week. But if you are a member of another church, we don't want this to be in any way, shape, form, or fashion a substitute for you being connected to your local body. So our prayer is, is that God uses His Word to change you and to change others. So we pray that God will use you and this message for His glory. Have a great day. One of the well-known passages of Scripture uh, this season is Luke chapter 2. And I want to read to you just a a few verses. The Bible says that in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, will you say it with me? Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You know, we at the church have been going through a series called The Songs of Christmas, and and I love Christmas music. Maybe you love Christmas music, because I want to ask you, what is your favorite Christmas song? I want you to say it out loud, so I'm going to give you a second. Here we go. Think about it. One, two, three. Grandma got ran over by a reindeer. (laughs) What was yours? You know, this season is one of those rare holidays that's celebrated by both the religious and the irreligious, the not so religious. And and as I said earlier, one of the hallmarks of this season is music. I, I went on the Google machine and I found that there are over a million Christmas songs, a million of them. But there are some that are well, well familiar, that some that we've sang tonight, and some that are not so familiar. But, but the top three recorded songs, the most recorded songs of the Christmas season, the first one, the most recorded of all time is Silent Night. It was, it's been recorded 137,315 times. It's a lot. The second most recorded song is White Christmas. Now, we don't sing that a lot here in Naples. Maybe they do in Michigan. I don't know. But it's been recorded 128,276 times. And then, just as we sang a minute ago, the third is Jingle Bells, 89,681 times. Well, my favorite Christmas song is a song we just heard, O Holy Night. And if you know anything about the background of this story, it's actually a pretty interesting story of how this song came into being. It actually all takes place in a small French town in 18. 18- 47. There was a new Catholic church. It was built, and the local priest uh, wanted to dedicate uh, this, this new facility with a special Christmas Eve hymn. And so he got one of his friends who was in town, who was well known in town for being a, a great poet, a great lyricist. He was also the commissioner of wine, and he just happened to be a socialist who was also an alcoholic. Oh, and by the way, he had left the church years before that and and really hadn't returned. And so the priest wanted to maybe get his friend back in the Christmas spirit. And so after a few glasses of wine, according to the story, uh, the gentleman said, yes, I will write the lyrics to the new Christmas hymn. 
And so, as after he agreed, he got one of his friends, who was a well-known composer from Paris, to write the tune to the song. But here's the interesting thing. His friend, who was a composer from Paris, didn't believe in Jesus. He was a Jew. And so here you have an agnostic lyricist and a Jewish composer putting together one of the most beautiful songs ever, and it debuted in 1847 on Christmas Eve, and when it went out, it spread. The song spread like wildfire, and the next couple of Christmas seasons, every church in France was singing it until the Catholic Church officials found out that it wasn't written by Christians, and so they banned it. And so it went into silence for a few years until 18. 55, when a Unitarian minister who really wasn't a Christian uh, but was an abolitionist, a guy now by the name of John Dwight, translated the song from French to English, published it in an American magazine to use politically in the A in the fight against slavery in America. And when it came out, it became wildly popular in all the northern churches in the northern states during the Civil War. And so it's a very interesting. There's some folklore also about this in 1870 during the Franco-Prussian War. I know many of you are familiar with that war. Uh, On Christmas Eve, there was a moment where two, where the Germans and the French were in the trenches and they were fighting each other. And one of the French soldiers waved a flag of ceasefire. He came up out of the trenches and started to sing in French, Oh, Holy Night. Then one of the soldiers on the German side came out of his trenches and also began to sing, and they sang together, and they decided to have a ceasefire for Christmas. Now, we don't know if that's true or not, but it makes a good sermon story. (laughs) What we do know is true is that in 1906, on Christmas Eve, a protege under Thomas Edison was the first recorded voice on radio It wasn't a beep, 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 beep. And the first words on radio were Luke chapter 2. And the first song ever played on the radio was played on the violin, O Holy Night. Now, the interesting thing, as I said earlier, is that neither the writer nor the composer believed in the song that they wrote, but yet they saw the wonder and the beauty of Christmas and the person of Jesus Christ. See, the night that Jesus was born was different than any other night, and its significance is eternal. The reason that the song has been so popular ever since it was written in 1847 is because of the deep truths found within the lyrics that speak to the very soul of every Every human who has ever heard it. It speaks of the pining of the world and the appearing of the Lord. And it calls us to fall on our knees and worship and surrender to Jesus. So let's just think through those, this that little part of the song. First, I want you to see the pining of the world. In the song it says, Long lay the world in sin and error pining. I mean, what was the world like before Jesus entered it? It was dark, it was broken, it was yearning, it was helpless, it was pining. Now, we don't really use that word pining, but the the word pining, if you go to the dictionary, it says to waste away in grief or in pain. Maybe you've heard some country music from old days in which they talk about pining, of an unbearable longing for a long lost love. Well, the world and humanity is broken by sin and error and is longing for the whole world to be made right again. Every one of us is born pining. We're searching, searching for our worth, searching for our value. See, every soul is broken and searching for significance. The pining of our hearts causes us to look for satisfaction in so many places. We look to money and accomplishments. We look to vacations and careers and education and relationships, trying to just feel worthy, trying to feel accepted, trying to feel desirable by others and to be loved. And and this pursuit of meaningfulness and happiness often leads in emptiness. How many of you watched the World Cup Sunday, the World Cup final? Some of you saw that? I was working, so I didn't get to watch it. But maybe if you were there, you saw the excitement of the Argentinian team. Yeah. Yeah. That's a messy fan over there. And then you saw the sadness and the emptiness of the French team. I don't know if you saw the picture of one of the French players, Mbappe. 
He won the, the golden boot. You see that? He's right there on the biggest stage, the biggest world stage, and he's gonna get all this money for winning this trophy. And he's so angry. And he's so upset. And so I was watching this because this happened after I was able to get home. I wanted to see this, the ceremony. And I began, I looked at this guy and I said, you know what? This guy is 23. He is good looking. He's got hair. <laughs> he's athletic. And then I Googled him and he's worth $150 million. And four years ago, at the age of 18, he won his first World Cup. But yet, four years later, here is a man angry and upset and empty. What does it tell you? It tells you it'll never be enough. Have you ever heard of Brad Pitt? <laughs> some of you have. Maybe some of you ladies in here, you've heard of him. I don't know. A few years ago, he was interviewed by Rolling Stone magazine. And, and here in this interview, here's what... Brad Pitt says, he says, I know all these things are supposed to seem important to us, the car, the condo, our versions of success. But if that's the case, why is the general feeling out there reflecting more isolation, desperation, and loneliness? Because all I know is that at this point in time, we're headed for a dead end, a numbing of the soul. And I don't want that. So the interviewer went and asked him, he says, well, do you have an answer for this? And Brad Pitt said, hey, man, I don't have any of those answers yet. Here's a guy who the world would say has everything, but yet really has nothing. And that's the reality of the world. It doesn't matter how much you have. There's a missing link. There's something missing. This pining, this dead end, this numbing of the soul is ultimately everyone's need for a right relationship with God. I mean, even though you may not know it and even though you may not believe it, you were created by God and you were created for God and the emptiness that you're feeling right now is a hole left in your heart that only God can fill. See, sin created the void in your heart and only God can fix your broken heart. So the song speaks about the pining of the world, but then it talks about the appearing of the Lord. It says, then he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Who is the he? Well, Luke tells us who the he is. It's the chapter two is the real life birth story of Jesus. Jesus was born into harsh realities, born in Roman occupation, under Roman occupation in 4 BC. He was born into a tiny town to Mary and Joseph. He was born in real time and real space and a real place to real people. And you say, why is that important? Here's why that's important, because a recent study was done in the United Kingdom in Great Britain, and it found that only 40% of Britons believed that Jesus was a real person, or they weren't sure. Think about that. You say, well, that seems to be how, but I think maybe some of you may not believe that Jesus was real. Maybe you think he's some made up figure. Bart Ehrman, who is a New Testament scholar and a devout agnostic, that is, he doesn't, he believes that there may be a God, but doesn't know who, wrote a book entitled, Did Jesus Exist? The Historical Argument for Jesus of Nazareth. And in this book, he says, the reality is, is that whatever else you may think about Jesus, he certainly did exist. This is held by virtually every expert on the planet. And then he goes on to say in the book that the Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the oldest and best sources that we have for knowing about the life of Jesus. And this is the view of all serious historians of antiquity of every kind, from committed evangelical Christians to hardcore atheists. And so Bart Ehrman, who does not believe that Jesus is God, says, regardless of what you may think, Jesus of Nazareth truly existed and if he truly existed, then how do you explain his life and how do you explain what happened after he came to this world? Those who are believers know why he came. It was an act of love. See, God demonstrated the very worth of our souls. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It was love that compelled Jesus to leave the worship of angels amid the unimaginable glories of heaven to enter into the quiet, vulnerable womb of a young Jewish girl to eventually appear in a world in humility, abject poverty, and rejection. 
Yet Jesus came and he voluntarily took upon himself the sins and the suffering of this broken world. He came to pay the price to fix our problems. It's been said that value is determined by the price someone is willing to pay. And as we think of this Christmas season, we think of so many presents and so many Christmas presents. People will spend all kinds of money that they may or may not have to buy things for their kids, to buy things for friends. Maybe some of it's great, some of it's junk. But there was a, a, a new article that said that the average American this year is going to spend $932 on their families for Christmas. Now, I want to be honest with you. When it comes to Christmas, I can be pretty cheap. <laughs> now, my wife is the opposite. She always wants to buy our kids all kinds of things. And we'll have conversations in September and October. And we'll say, you know, this year we're not going to spoil our kids. This year we're not going to do this. This year we're not going to do that. But yet she will go ahead and we have blown $932 out of the water. Because I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for my wife, we probably wouldn't have a Christmas tree and the kids would probably get three Amazon boxes. <laughs> Not wrapped. Here you go. The other day she, well, this is right before December, she came to me and she wanted to buy something for the kids. And it was really, really expensive. And she says, what do you think? Trick question, right? <laughs> Here's what I said. No, I don't think they need that. She was like, well, don't you love our kids? And I said, I do, but not that much. <laughs> My question to you is, how much are your kids worth to you? What price would you pay for them? Well, God loved you and me so much that he gave himself. How are you going to value God? How would you measure his value? He is infinitely valuable and absolutely priceless. And we are completely despicable, horrible, evil, and undeserving. And yet God, when we were his enemies, when we were rebels, he gave himself for us. But don't get the idea that he gave himself for us because we're some prize. See, we're not loved because we're valuable. But we're valuable because he loves us. See, the, the heart's longing. If you want to know how much your soul is worth, uh, if you want to find significance and, and meaning and worth, because many of you are looking for love in all the wrong places, if you want to find where true love is, it is found in the appearance of Jesus on this earth. Because Jesus spared no expense in rescuing you. How much does God love us? He loves us this much. See, in Christ, the soul finds and feels its worth. Even while we were sinners, the Bible says, Christ died for us. One of my favorite Christmas movies, and I'm not commending you to go out and watch it, is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. <laughs> Amen. And here's what I want you to understand. Everybody has a Cousin Eddie in their family. And if you don't think you do, then it's probably you. <laughs> Ethel, I don't know. Do we have a Cousin Eddie? I don't know, Edward. <laughs> Could be you. So if you've heard the story, you haven't, you've been living under a rock. It's a story of Clark W. Griswold and his pursuit of a perfect Christmas. He wanted to have all this wonderful time with his family. He wanted to tell them that he's going to put a pool in for Christmas. But instead, he got a subscription to the Jelly of the Month Club. <laughs> and as Cousin Eddie said, it's the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, as hard as Clark tried, nothing seemed to work the way he wanted, and he was extremely frustrated. Well, the reason I tell you that is because every year, we want Christmas to be something special. We want that movie moment with twinkling snow and contented family and the quiet glow of yuletide perfection. 
And yet every year it seems that we feel a little ripped off when the sun sets. Every year it seems like that maybe the day didn't turn out as satisfying as we thought. And maybe you'll have the greatest Christmas ever tomorrow. But, but yet on the 26th, no matter how great your Christmas was on the 25th, your troubles do not magically float away. You still don't have enough money. Your heart is still broken. It doesn't instantly mend. And the seat that was left this Christmas by a past loved one still feels empty. See, we pin a lot of expectations on Christmas Day. And for many of us, it just doesn't seem to meet the task. So this Christmas, tomorrow, just like the first one, I want you to understand it's not holy, nor is it divine. It's just a day. It's a day on the calendar that will have ups and downs and highs and lows. But, but I want you to understand, it's not the day in the calendar that is special. It's the person who came that makes that day special. Because Jesus is holy and Jesus is divine. And what we celebrate on this day is the birth of a Savior who can handle all our expectations, all our fears, anger, and loneliness. And he died and rose from the dead to break our chains, to teach us to love one another, and to cause all oppression to cease. And so what is our response to this gift? The song tells us. Fall on your knees and worship. Surrender your life to Jesus. Stop trying to be good enough. Stop trying to find your value and significance in what you do and what you don't do. And just surrender your life to Jesus. That's the, the call. The call is to join with the angels in heaven and the shepherds who came to the manger and the millions upon millions of millions who have come to Jesus and had their chains broken, their lives changed, their fears taken, and their hope renewed. But you know what my fear is? My fear is, is that just like the songwriter and just like the composer who wrote O Holy Night, you can know the story you can sing the songs, you can come to a service and still never surrender your life to the Savior. But this evening, I wanna give you an opportunity to do that. Just as many has, have done just in the previous service, I, I wanna give you an opportunity to, to give your life to Jesus. You don't have to say some sort of magical words. There's nothing that I need to do for you. It's really just simply faith and trust in Jesus. And maybe you're here and you've never really given him your life because you're thinking, well, there's a scale when I die. And if I've got enough good to outweigh my bad, I'll make it. And if I don't, then I'll, I won't make it. But that's not what God says. Jesus didn't come so that you can make a mess out of your life and fix yourself. Jesus came into your mess to get you out of the mess. And you only get out of the mess by giving your life to him. And so I want to give you that opportunity. Maybe you are feeling those feelings in your heart, the emptiness, but also the excitement right now. That, that could be God speaking to you. So would you just bow your heads, close your eyes. And if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. And if you're here and you want to trust Jesus as your Savior, would you pray a prayer like this with me? Would you say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I am empty inside. But today I believe that Jesus, you came to this earth for me. That you lived a perfect life for me. That you died on the cross for me. And that you rose from the dead for me. And I don't really know what to say other than I surrender my life to you. I give you my life. Save me, Jesus. Forgive me. 
and help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray right now for those who may have just trusted you for the very first time, that you would give them the courage and the boldness to make it known and that you would help them get connected to a church that will help them in their walk. Father, for those in this room who do know you as Savior, but God, they've, they've, come, they've gotten out of church, they've gotten away from you, God, tonight, would you bring them closer to you, Lord? Would you get them connected? And Father, for those who just have prayer requests and prayer needs, that they came in here so overwhelmed, so burdened, God, would you break their chains? Would you release their fears? Would you renew their hope? I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. If you remember that card, talked to you about earlier. If you would, everybody in this room, and even if you're a church member, you've been coming here for a long time, you have no idea how you doing this could help someone else who's maybe a little nervous to have the courage to let it not be known. And maybe you have a prayer need that we can pray for. So on this card, if you didn't get one, that's okay. In the little chair back in front of you, if you sat in not a not front row, uh, but even if you did, you can just reach behind. You can get one of these cards. And, and, and I think everyone's gonna make a decision today. And so the first decision maybe you're gonna make today is decision A. You just put the letter A and it says, I'm already a believer, but please pray for me. And you can just put on the back your prayer request and we'll pray for you. Or maybe you want to put the letter B and says, you know what, I'm a believer, but I've never gone public. I've never shared this with anyone. I need to be baptized, not to be saved, but to share the world that I am a Christian and I want to do that. You put the letter B or maybe tonight, just like we had in our last service, you say, you know what, tonight I gave my life to Christ. I've been fighting it for a long time, but tonight I said, yes, I said yes to Jesus. I surrendered my life. Just put the letter C. It says, I committed my life to Christ. Or maybe you've been coming to this church, you'd like to learn a little bit more. You could put the letter D and say, I'd like to discover a little bit more about first. We wanna help you in your faith walk. We wanna help you in your journey. So let's all stand, get your candles out. Thank you for joining us as we go through God's word together. I pray again that God will transform you from the inside out. So as we say here at first, you have come to church, Go out and be the church. Have a great week of worship. We can't wait to see you soon.